Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and to our lectionary podcast. We are now in the third Sunday in Advent as we prepare again for the coming of our Lord, who will come again in glory and who came to us as the babe of Bethlehem. And again, we are now with uh, uh, John the Baptist, who is the forerunner who prepares us for the coming of Jesus. Again, he represents in many ways all the prophets who have come before him. He represents the entirety of the Old Testament witness to the prophecies, to the, uh, uh, to the predictions, to the foretellings of the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, we see at the beginning this, the, the, this Advent um, theme, we see that... Uh, John, having heard when he is in, in prison, in a sense, John does represent uh, the Old Testament there because the Old Testament, the people are constantly, um, if not in prison, they are in exile. They are waiting for the coming of the Lord to release them, um, to bring salvation. Uh, it's constantly a, a desire for the final exodus to occur. John is in prison, and um, he hears about the works of, of, of Christ, of the Christ, of the Messiah. So this is the anointed one. And um, so he sends his, his own disciples. John has his disciples, those who follow him, his students. And um, here we can see the Advent theme emerging in, in verse 3, this is the question that we should ask. Um, are you the coming one? Well, that's Advent. It's the coming of our Lord. The Lord who will come on the last day. The Lord who uh, was anticipated coming a, as the babe of Bethlehem. The Lord who continues to come to us now in preaching and in the supper. This coming one. Are you the coming one? Or should we wait for another? So, Again, this is kind of an old question people have asked. Um, did John the Baptist not know? He, after all, was the one who said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And I don't think this is a black or white question. I think this is the kind of question that we all ask, even as we have faith. <clears throat> we ask a question in order to be assured, to be reassured of that which we know and believe. Um, this is what we do every Sunday when we go to church. We ask this question even as we confess that Christ is the Lord. We want to hear that answer again. We want to hear there's something about Christmas. It's celebrated every year, and we, every year it's new to us, even though it's the same story. And um, it's the comfort that we receive, that we ask for, that God gives to us in his word. So are you the coming one, or should we wait for another? And, you know, John needs this because he's in... He's in prison, and he wants to hear this good news about the one who sets the captives free. So Jesus answered and said, well, going, go to him, announce to John, go tell this good news to John, um, what you have heard and what you have seen. And this is, this is what uh, the apostles are all about. The apostles will tell the world. What they have heard Jesus say, what they have seen Jesus do. Um, well, this is the message. The blind see again. Ah, yes. And, and the lame, the lame are walking. And the lepers, well, they're cleansed. And the deaf, they, they hear again. And we look forward to the day and the, and the dead are raised. And finally, of course, um, the greatest miracle, the greatest miracle of all is the poor are evangelized. Now that almost sounds like um, the Gospel of Luke, where the good news is spoken not to uh, Caesar, in, Caesar Augustus in Rome, but the good news is spoken to poor, lowly shepherds. Um, Blessed are the poor in spirit, Matthew says. Luke says, blessed are the poor. 
the poor are evangelized. Um, this is the greatest, the greatest miracle of all. Now, this, it is interesting because um, when you look at this, where this falls, this falls in chapter 11. In chapters 8 and 9, uh, it's in those chapters that uh, we see that Matthew puts together the 10 miracles of Jesus, and they're representative of what Jesus did throughout his whole ministry. I like to make this point that um, in the miracles of Jesus, we really, what we see are the miracles of baptism. Because in baptism, our eyes are opened. In baptism, we uh, ra are raised up so that we live a new life and we're able to walk again, walk in this newness of life. We're cleansed of our sins. Um, our ears are opened uh, so that we can hear God's word. Our eyes also, I suppose, are open so that we can see who Christ is. And all of this happens when the patoikoi, when the poor, are evangelized. And the evangelism comes with the baptismal message, with baptism itself, which accomplishes these great miracles. In chapters 8 and 9, it's Jesus who does them. In chapters 10, Jesus sends out his disciples to do this very thing. And this will be the mission of the church to evangelize the poor and to make these, um, because of Christ's resurrection, then um, all of everything will be, our bodies will be renewed uh, into eternity. So this is the, the, good, the good news that our, that our Lord has to, to offer. And um, then we have a kind of, we have a, a, a bat, we have a, a blessing. And uh, blessed is the one who is not scandalized in or by me. And uh, this, is, this is, I suppose, one of the frustrating things about being in the church is we have such a great gift and such a great Savior, and yet uh, people, um, many do not believe. Blessed is the one who is not scandalized. That um, When you think about the, the birth of our Lord, it was in lowly circumstances. Somehow the wise men who came from the east saw Jesus for who he was and brought him uh, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And these great men were not scandalized um, to kneel down to, to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet uh, w when we meet our Lord, um, he comes in, we saw at the beginning of Advent, lowly and riding in on a donkey. Uh, we see him in a uh, in Bethlehem, and he comes and he's uh, born into humble circumstances and must flee the wrath of Herod and go into hiding. He doesn't seem like this great and powerful king, and yet in the lowliness is the glory. In the lowly birth is our king. In the crucifixion we find our savior. So blessed, blessed is the one who is not scandalized by me, even if you happen to be in, in jail, wondering where is the power of God. The power of God is there and will be revealed fully when our Lord comes again in glory on that last day with all of his angels with him. And um, so in verse 7, we see um, Jesus continues on with this story. He says, as they... As they went away, as they were going, the, the disciples of John, Jesus began to say again to the crowds concerning John. Well, what kind of a person is John? And I, lo I just love this. I just love this. What did you go? Why? What did you go out in the desert to see? Um, then this, all of Jerusalem was going out into the desert to see John the Baptist. Oh, what did you think you were going to see out there? Was he a, a reed shaken? By the wind, um, you know, was he the kind of person who put his, who uh, wet his fingers and seeing which way the, the wind blows? No, he's he's not like that. He was a man with a, a firm message. Um, well, then, what did you go out to see? And you know, this is a good thing to think about when you think about what you want in your own pastor, because do you want a personality? Do you want somebody who's going to speak to your itching ears? Do you want somebody who's always going to say exactly what you want to hear? 
or do you want somebody who's actually gonna, who loves you? Who loves you enough to tell you what you need to hear because he cares less about his own popularity than he cares about your salvation. And that's John the Baptist. He speaks with courage because it's the courage of love. He's not going to be shaken by the wind, you know, whatever popular opinion is about what, you know, all the things that are changing in our world and we want to go along and get along. Well, forget what the world has to say. Instead, look to see what the scriptures have to say. See what God has to say. And that's what John the Baptist does. He's not a, he's not a reed shaken by the wind. And, um, well, what, what, did you go out to see this? Did you see a man who is um, dressed in, this is just, this is just great, in, in malakois, in soft clothing? Um, there are con connotations here. It's, um, it's a word that's often associated with like effeminate clothing. Um, it's the kind of clothing um, that the rich would wear, um, but the one who maybe doesn't have any dirt under his fingernails, the one who doesn't want to get his hands dirty, the one who comes to you always looking polished, his hair is perfect. On the other hand, um, he might just be using the ministry in order to attain wealth for himself, to attain glory for himself, uh, to look pretty. Well, uh, John the Baptist did not come to look pretty. He didn't come to wear soft clothes. Um, in fact, uh, our Lord says that uh, those who wear soft clothing um, are those who are, again, that soft malachi. Those who put on soft clothing are in the houses of kings. Now, again, um, maybe Luke picks up on this fact when you look at Jesus' own birth and he is dressed in swaddling clothes. There's nothing there are no great purple garments. Um, we're never told that our Lord's robes were anything to behold. He was nothing. He was. He didn't come to us in human wealth or human power. Um, and John the Baptist, he is a rough person out in the desert, and he's not living in the house of kings. He is a. He is a true prophet. And um, now, what did you then go out to see? A prophet? Well, there you go, a prophet. Yes, I tell you, and and more than a prophet. So this is high praise indeed for, for John the Baptist. Um, uh, this is the one, this is the one of whom it was written. So again, Matthew loves to uh, show that the story of Christ and the coming of Christ is in fulfillment of the Old Testament. This is the one, John the Baptist, of whom it is written, Behold, edu, I apostello, the, the apostle word, I send before you an angelon, an angel, or a messenger, my messenger, before your face. Now, again, we see the Advent theme here. Um, is Jesus the coming one? Are you the coming one? And here, uh, John the Baptist, he comes before your face, he will prepare your way before you. Um, we saw this at the beginning of Advent when uh, the road for Jesus, the way to Jesus was paved, or if not paved, they put down branches uh, so that Jesus could come in riding in on, that, uh, on, on the donkey. And uh, so prepare the royal highway for Jesus and um, John the Baptist, that is what he is going to do. He's going to prepare the way. And um, it was hard work for, for, for John to do this. He had to live a, an austere lifestyle. Um, he wasn't eating and drinking with the people. He was out in the desert. He was wearing rough clothing. And his message was a stark one, one of repentance. And I do think it's worth uh, reminding ourselves, especially as the institution of Marriage is under attack in, in our nation and has been redefined and undefined. It's good to remember that John the Baptist lost his head, for, uh, had his head chopped off because he called King Herod to account. Um, well, about this, John, amen, I say to you, truly I say to you, 
that there is not one who has been born or been ra been raised who is born of women who is greater than John the Baptist. He is the greatest of all of all the prophets. He is the final prophet. He is the one who sees Jesus and points to him. And um, but then he, there's this mysterious statement afterwards. The one who is smaller, or it's a comparative, sometimes comparatives can be used as superlatives. The one who is smaller, or the one who is smallest in the kingdom of the heavens, a good Mithian phrase, is greater than he is. Now, some will say, um, one way of looking at this is that all of us who are in the church, having been baptized by Christ, in a sense, are an, at a greater vantage point than John the Baptist. And certainly all the prophets long to see what we have now, the fulfillment. Um, or on the other hand, I think this is probably the way I would go with this, the one who is smaller in the kingdom of the heavens is greater. Uh, Jesus here could be preaching about himself. And... Um, John, you know, Jesus, in some sense, um, it does tie in beautifully, I think, with the Christmas message. We think our Lord, uh, we think about the fact that our Lord came to us as an unborn babe. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, so small in the womb of his mother Mary. He came to us as a little child, and he comes to us in lowliness and in humility and in a sense, um, he made himself small uh, so that we might be made great. He made himself uh, meek, micro teros. So Jesus is, in that sense, he is the, he is the small one. And uh, so the prophets must give way to the coming of the Christ. Um, now, uh, Again, it's, it's, uh, we, we had this text uh, not too long ago. I guess it was for the Reformation. But um, from, the, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of the heavens, there's that phrase again that Matthew love, loves, is biadzata, is taken by force. And the strong... And the strong sees it. And um, this probably, again, is a reference to the violence that comes upon the church, that came upon Christ. Um, this is the violence that we saw with King Herod when Jesus was born and the, the slaughter of the holy innocents. This is the violence that comes upon, upon Jesus, who um, is put to death. Uh, by the religious leaders and then by Pontius Pilate. This is the, the violence that comes upon Peter and upon Paul and all the apostles that um, uh, the, ch the church today is persecuted through, throughout all the world. This is, um, we see it in John the Baptist himself who is taken again by uh, King Herod's violence, his senseless and horrific and uh, really mean-spirited violence that even though he knows that John the Baptist is a good preacher, he likes to hear him preach, and yet he has John's head, head cut off. But this is the way it will always been and has always been with the church as God sent his um, messengers to the vineyard and uh, the owners of the vineyard, those who were, had the vineyard, would um, kill every messenger and finally kill his son. Uh, so it was, has always been, so all of the prophets and the law until John the Baptist prophesied. So uh, this is the way it has always uh, been. Now, they, um, it, who is this? And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah, the one who is um, about to come. Now this does bring us right to the right to the cross. Again, this brings us to the words of, of Jesus um, at the cross. Uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
the Eli, Eli, lama? Well, they hear it and they say he's calling out for Elijah. And the great, the great tragedy of it all is that Elijah has already come. As I like to say, the people of Jerusalem, they are like, it's like a peop person standing on the railroad tracks and you're waiting for the train to come, but they don't know that the train not just went right past them. So they hear the train, but the train is, is, is already leaving the station that they've missed out. Elijah has come in the person of John the Baptist, and Elijah having come, now Jesus has come um, to be our Savior. So while the world might wait for a Messiah, they might wait for a Savior in any kind of form. People look forward to somebody who will save them, whether it's politically or religiously or in any way. That Savior has already come. And that's Christ the Lord. It was that babe of Bethlehem. That was the one. And it's that one who will come again. This is the message that we proclaim, having been sent by our Lord. This is the message of the church and of the angels, that is the, the pastors, the messengers today. And the one who has ears, we say, let him hear. And, uh, and that's why we will keep, comp uh, we will keep proclaiming this message, uh, the message of the angels, the Messiah indeed has come and that he has come to save us and that he will come again. And for this we give thanks to God and I also thank you for spending some time with us and we look forward to following along as we prepare for the coming of Christmas. Thank you.